look up. The path that lays ahead is harsh, but you have not been left to wander it alone. The Lord your God will be by your side every step of the way. He'll lead you by the hand, keeping watch of your path. Look up. Remember what he's already delivered you from. This faithfulness is a pattern. He's promised to never leave you or forsake you, and these promises never return void. Though the land be dry, he will use this place to spring up new life within you. He is your fire by night and shade in the heat of day. Look up. He's providing a way for you. Summer Rook, great to see you. Looking forward to diving into God's Word with you. If you would, go ahead and pull out your message notes, and we're going to dive in together here this morning as we dig in. Um, you can either follow uh, on your church center app or in the message notes in your info guide. So good to have you. Today we're going to look at how can we have a relationship with a holy God. Uh, I, I tend to wrestle with uh, how can I continue to be in relationship uh, or even have a relationship with a God who's perfect, all loving and holy. And I, I know I'm not alone. I'm sure you, you struggle as well. And, and how do you do this? How do you have this type of relationship with the Lord where he's this perfect heavenly father that is perfectly holy and thank God God gives us answers in his word and we're going to look at that today because I, I really believe we're going to look at this moment in the book of Leviticus uh, that it's going to be life-changing for every one of us As a matter of fact if you would pull out your Bibles or you can follow along on the screen to uh, Leviticus 16 Leviticus 16, verse 30. And Scripture says here, For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all of your sins. And, and so we're, we're looking at Leviticus 16, 30, uh, the um, day of atonement. And then in Leviticus 17, 11, it shares, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Uh, the, the, in the, li there, the blood is the, is, is, that is shed for you, Scripture shares here, that makes atonement by the life. And then in Leviticus 22, the second part is verse 16, Scripture shares, For I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So it is the Lord who sanctifies us. And a uh, matter of fact, the title of this message is The Sanctifier. It, the Sanctifier, the one who sets us apart, the one who makes us holy. So God makes us holy so that we can be in relationship with him. So we're going to look at that in these passages of scripture with the Day of Atonement. Now, the, the Day of Atonement as a matter of fact, go ahead and throw up the, the, the books of the Bible real quick. On the Day of Atonement, what we have here, the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And, and so you have it, and then, and then it dives into, I'm sorry, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I'd already ran out of one of the books, and I'm like, I know it's not Joshua. What did I leave out of there? And so, uh, so we have the, uh, ex, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In the center of that, Leviticus, in the center of Leviticus is the Day of Atonement, which is the sacrifice of all sacrifices. And so these first five books of the Bible are called the Law, uh, the Torah, uh, the, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. But right here in the center of these, this first section of the books of the Bible is the Day of Atonement. And that's what we're going to look at today, and we're going to uh, break it down in our personal lives. But before we do, I, I want to hit on what Craig just shared uh, about Father's Day. And, and uh, just from my heart, I just want to say, hey, happy Father's Day, men. Great to have you here. 
uh, today. Uh, this message will be for all men, but also uh, ladies. Uh, for anyone, uh, this message is going to speak directly to you today. But I just want you to know, uh, Father's Day for years early on for me in church was really hard. It was really difficult. I had a gaping father wound. I really needed a lot of healing. And, and through the years, it has been amazing how much healing the, the sanctifier God has done in my heart and life. And so now I, I, I look forward to uh, Father's Day big time. I love it. There, I, I see myself as a wounded healer, uh, a leader who walks with a limp but has been healed by God. And, and so I encourage you, I really believe there's deep healing in your life. And the, the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16 speaks directly to that. And not only, it may not be a father wound. Maybe you've been wanting to have a family with kids and have not been able to yet. Or maybe you, you have some current broken relationship in your life and today brings up those issues. Uh, maybe you lost your dad this past year or two. Maybe a wayward child and you're feeling it inside today. I want you to know our prayers are with you. And we're just praying God's grace and God's miracle working power to bring healing in your life. So as we find this healing in Christ, whether it's a father wound or any other area, uh, when we're, we're talking about Leviticus, there is so much animal sacrifice that's going on in the book of Leviticus. And it's really gruesome. I mean, it is gruesome. And, and so we're asking the question, uh, why has it got to be so gruesome? And I believe one of the biggest takeaways we need to have about that is this, that sin's a big deal. That the gruesomeness of animal sacrifice and the blood being shared, shed, that gruesomeness, that sin is a big deal. So we need to continue to find healing in Christ. And, and, and not only uh, is the gruesomeness when we look at it in the Old Testament of animal sacrifices, but in the, the New Testament, the, the, the blood that was shed in Jesus Christ when he went to the cross is big time gruesome. His flesh being ripped open by being beat. That, so we need to take sin very seriously, and there was a high price to be paid for that sin. So as we're studying this, uh, I really believe our eyes can be uh, really open to that. So Day of the Atonement is the sacrifice of all sacrifices, and this offering only happens once a year. And So go ahead and throw up the picture of the uh, tent of meeting, the tabernacle. If you go ahead and throw that up. Uh, so what you have here is you have the outer courts where you, you see that uh, the skirt tent all the way around it and uh, all the, the tent sides there. And then you have what goes into that tent that you see in this picture is the holy place. But then there is a holy of holies that is separated by a curtain where, the only, where the, only the high priest goes in and only once a year to the holy place. Of holies. And so we're going to look at uh, Leviticus 16 and, and break down several verses here and look and see how it speaks uh, to us. Leviticus 16, 2. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So Aaron, who's Moses' brother, is the high priest, and he's to enter in only uh, once a year into the most holy place. And, and during the, the uh, Day of Atonement, he would be wearing different clothing for the Day of Atonement. The priest would have normal clothing, but the high priest would have normal clothes. But on this day, it would be very plain. And, and I'm, I'm convinced that's because it's just, he was to come in just in a humble state. And before he put on this clothing, he would, he would wash, he would take a bath, which was another sign of the importance of cleanliness. And, and now I want to jump to the end of Leviticus uh, 16, 29, more to the end of it, and, and read that part to you, then we'll jump back up. And it shall be a statue to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves 
and do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. This was uh, uh, Tishri, September, October, month of Tishri. And so on the 10th day of the seventh month, the, the Israelites and the strangers are to afflict themselves, which means they are to humble their souls. They are to uh, have this time of prayer and fasting, and there would be no work being done. This is a big deal, and I want us to understand that. This Day of Atonement, they're, they're, they're Sabbathing. There's, there's no work being done. Uh, they're humbling themselves. They're praying. They're fasting. But it's only the high priest that's going into the Holy of Holies and, and, and to present the offering. The sacrifice of all sacrifices that everyone is humbling themselves before the Lord on this day. Now let's jump back up to Leviticus 16 verse 5. And, and now this is referring back to the high priest. And he, the high priest, shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. So this bull was for him and his family's sins. Verse 7 of Leviticus 16. And then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. In our day, to kind of like uh, they would cast lots, and kind of like dice, they would cast lots, and, and the, the Lord would determine which goat would be of the two uh, process here, which I'll explain on which the, the lot fell for the Lord used uh, and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, and it shall be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Now one would be sacrificed, and the other would go out into the wilderness. So Aaron prepares a bull, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, atoning for the house of the priests. He also prepares two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, atoning for the people. Now, one of the two goats for the people's sins purifies the tent of meeting, which I showed you a picture of, while the other is presented alive to, present, uh, to be sent away into the wilderness. Now, the meaning here of Azazel is uncertain. Many take it to be a proper name since it is parallel to the Lord in verse 8 and thus conclude that it is the name either of an otherwise unknown demon or of a place. The tradition explanation is that Azazel is a compound word combining goat with going away. The word would then mean goat that goes away, hence the conventional scapegoat. Each of these explanations has its difficulties. In any event, the, the point is clear. The goat is sent out in order to take, away the sin, to take away the sin of Israel. So let's, let's look at this. Uh, of the, so uh, the one goat is, uh, is sacrificed and, and the blood is cleansing the tent of meeting and covering it. And then we pick it up in Leviticus 16 verse 20. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place with this goat and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And, and so this is now moving to the one that stays alive. And scripture shares that Aaron shall place both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess o over it all the iniquities of all the Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. So Aaron places his hands on the live goat as a, a, as a symbol of all, I'm emphasizing because here in Scripture, it emphasizes all the sins of Israel. 
go on to this goat. And he shall put on them the, the, the head of the goat and send it away in the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So then they have another individual take who has been chosen to take this goat. And I'll read it to you, verse 22. And the goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area. And he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. So the two goats, the one is sacrificed for cleansing. Then the other goat is not killed. It's a live goat. And Aaron places his hands on the live goat. Jacob, can you hand me that truck right there on the front row there? Appreciate that. Uh, so it's like um, my kids used to love when they were real young. When, uh, my, my, matter of fact, my daughter Mary uh, called them the trashers. And so and they just think it was so cool that when they would come to get our garbage, matter of fact, on Christmas, uh, the week after Christmas, when you get rid of your Christmas tree, uh, and the, uh, the trashers that she called the trashers came to get the Christmas tree, she asked Jenny and I, hey, are they going to bring our Christmas tree back? And so it was just really cool and explaining, no, they, they take that to, you know, a place where they get rid of all the Christmas trees. And, and, uh, and so it was fun. But when, when we think of um, uh, a garbage truck taking all of our garbage away, or if you're a little kid, the, the, like my daughter would call it, the trashers, is they would take all the trash away. The scapegoat, the second goat, is like a garbage truck. Of all the sins, all of our garbage, all of the sinfulness of the people of Israel, that it would carry the, all these sins away and, and take them out into the wilderness. So th what we're looking at here is it's really like a, a, the goat is like a garbage truck. So Aaron leaves, his, so as this has happened, then Aaron leaves the Day of Atonement clothes inside the holy place because they are holy. They're not to be worn for the normal activity of the high priest. And he washes again. And matter of fact, the person who handles the Azazel goat that goes out into the wilderness and lets it go also washes himself because they're, uh, uh, I'm sure because they're saying now he is ceremonially unclean so he washes as well then we pick it up uh, Leviticus 16 verse 32 and 33 which is a, a review of what we just shared and the high priest who was anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing his holy the holy linen garments he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Wow, this is so good. So rich. Now, this day of atonement. Now let's jump to the New Testament. Now remember. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, and it was only once a year, and it was only him, into where the Ark of the Covenant was, into the presence of God. And in Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51, Scripture shares, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. So when Jesus Christ dies on the cross for the sins of all the world, this curtain is ripped from top to bottom. What has happened? God has provided a way so that a sinful people can be in relationship with a holy God, but no longer does the high priest need to go in uh, once a year to offer this uh, sacrifice? It has been done on the cross that now because of Jesus, what he's done, that we have instant access into the presence of God. This is awesome. 
This is so cool when you look at this uh, Day of Atonement and then how it points red thread in the wilderness to Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. So when this t thick temple veil that covered the doorway to the Holy of Holies was torn in two by God, God was indicating that the Old Testament priesthood was no longer necessary. Now people could directly go to God through the great high priest who? So directly to God, the great high priest, Jesus. Now let's jump into also, uh, let's look at uh, Hebrews 10 verse 19 where God speaks to this as well about Jesus opening the way to the Holy of Holies. He, red thread, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through faith, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God. Now, Jesus' flesh is the curtain. His flesh was ripped open now because of what the blood, of, what Christ did dying on the cross for our sins, his flesh being poured out for us, his blood from his ripped flesh, the scripture says, is the curtain. So now we can approach the Holy of Holies. Now, this is what's neat as well when uh, because what we have now is Hebrews 10 transitions. And, and it transitions like this. In light of this, this is what you are to do. In light that this has happened, this is what you are to do. Verse 22 of Hebrews 10. And what this is, this is a textbook of walking out practically the Day of Atonement and the ultimate Day of Atonement Jesus Christ and what he did for our forgiveness of sins. So let's walk through this in applying it. Verse 22 says, let us draw near, Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And not neglecting to meet together as, in the, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So let's break this down. Of, uh, okay. I get the doorway's been opened, the curtain's been opened through Jesus. Now that we can approach God with, uh, with confidence. So let's walk this out. What, what is uh, verse 22 through 25? Number one, we have confidence that we're able to draw near to the sanctifier with full assurance of faith to hold fast to our confession. Uh, that means you don't need to go into God's presence in shame. You need to go into God's presence with confidence, with encouragement, that we need to draw near to the sanctifier. That's another takeaway here, that we can draw close to the Lord. Scripture goes on to say uh, that our hearts are sprinkled clean. What that means is you see in the Old Testament is there was a sprinkling of the blood that our hearts are sprinkled clean because of what Jesus did for us. So I want to ask you a question about your sins. Is the sacrifice of Jesus enough for you? Is there going to be another sacrifice? Absolutely not. That Jesus died on the cross for you, that is the ultimate sacrifice. Then it goes on and Hebrews 10, it shares this. Let us consider how to stir up one another. Let's consider, I mean, I, I love how it says, let, let's think about it. Let's consider, let's ponder how we can encourage one another. That's another takeaway today. If you want to make headway, you need a, think about it. Think about it. Who's discouraged around you right now? Who is it? Who, who do you need to stir up 
to good works? Who do you need to consider, ponder, that you can speak encouragement and life into them? That's a real practical step here is that it's not just for you. This freedom is something that you need to really consider. Hey, how do I encourage someone else who's discouraged? And maybe someone in your life that you know uh, uh, on this Father's Day you need to encourage. It, it may be uh, someone that, uh, that, man, you know that right now or need just a, a dose of encouragement. Or you may be thinking, man, that's me. I need to speak. I, I need some encouragement. Well, let me uh, stir you up some. God loves you. He's got good plans for you. I encourage you because of what Jesus did on the cross, you, can, you have instant access into the very presence of God, into the holy of holies. So, matter of fact, turn to someone next to you and say, hey, God's got good plans for you. Go ahead right now. Your neighbor on the left and right, God's got good plans for you. And then, not only that, but what Scripture says is don't neglect meeting together. Don't do it. Don't neglect meeting together. Meaning be consistent to church and to group. A turn to a person to you and say, hey, good job coming to church today. Scripture says not to neglect meeting together. Ephesians 3.12 says, in him in whom we have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. Jesus has given us access into his presence. Now I want us to look at another area as well, and then we're going to go into an old worship song that really spoke to my heart that we're going to do as response today. In 1 Peter 2, 5, when we're talking about the priesthood of the believer, this is powerful. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What this is saying, we no longer need a high priest as our representative. That Jesus is the perfect, ultimate high priest. And knowing that, now, because of that, Scripture says here in uh, uh, 1 Peter, as well as in Revelations, that we are now a kingdom of priests. We are the, the, what they call the priesthood of believer. That we're now God's representatives here on earth. We're his examples. Isn't that great news? That we, we are priests. We're, we're a holy priesthood, a kingdom of priests. Matter of fact, uh, First Peter, uh, we're his representatives now. First Peter 2, 9 and 10 shares. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And then it says this, proclaim. This is so cool. It says to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You, once you were not a people, but now you are the God's people. Once you had not received mercy, net, but now you have received mercy. We're, go, we're to proclaim the excellencies of him. What does that mean, proclaim? That means we're not to stay quiet. We're to share the good news with people around us. This is great news that we can approach the throne of grace with freedom and confidence. The curtain has been ripped. We have instant access into the presence of God as we place our faith in Christ and what he's done for us. It goes on and says, 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify the God on the day of his visitation. What Jesus did on the cross, he sanctified you. He is the sanctifier. He set you apart. He declared and made you holy as we place our faith in what Christ did. But then what this scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, now that he has made you holy, each one of us are to live holy. 
We're to uh, resist sin. We're to fear God, to have a holy reverence of God. God, thank you that you have declared me holy, that you're the sanctifier. But then, Lord, let me live like it. You've, we've heard statements, oh, people in Christ, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Sometimes I think that's an excuse that they can live the way they want to live. But then the other side of it, you know how we should respond? Let's make sure we're even more resistant to sin, that we live holy, that our lifestyles present Jesus in a way that people want what we have, that there is this incredible heart desire to live holy. Oh, God, I can't touch that sin anymore because of the high price that you paid on the cross for me. The gruesomeness of your sacrifice, sin is a big deal. So you sanctify me, and now you're declaring to me, live holy. Let's live like we believe what Christ called us to live. Could you imagine if we as Christ followers began to say, my lifestyle matters because sin is a big deal. Because we are a witness to the world. We're a priesthood of believer that we can proclaim the excellencies of him. Man, that we begin to draw near to God with freedom and confidence. Now, if you would stand up with me. And the, in the response, I'm going to pray for all of us. Some of you, you've never placed your faith in Christ and what he's done for you. Others of you, you have. And this is a renewal of your commitment to the Lord. And then we're going to go into this uh, worship song I sang years ago. Take me in. It's all about atonement, the day of atonement. It's all about what Jesus did for us. So as I'm going to pray, pray out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you're Lord. From this day forward, I choose to serve you. Jesus, come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of those sins. And God, help me to live differently. In Jesus' name. Now, I want to give you a challenge. As we go into this worship song, if you come on, come into service and you don't think about the worship much, you're like, can you get rid of the song singing? Let's get to the word. Or you don't even think about the words during the worship time. This time, think about the words. Reflect on them and meet with God. Lord, pray that God take me into the Holy of Holies because we now have instant access because of Jesus. Others of you, you've never lifted your hands up in, uh, in worship to God before. Take that step to lift your hands up in worship. Let this be a time where you're just, God, I, know, I want all of you. I want your presence in a mighty way. It may be, I, I can't go that far. Well, put them that right there before you. Just cup them right there before you. What I'm asking you to do, take another step in encountering God's presence. Amen. Let's go in to take me in. Let's worship from the depths of our hearts. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. Let's declare, let's declare his praises together. Take me past the outer courts into the holy place. Past the brazen altar, Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people, the priests who sing let's your let's praise. Let's lift our hands and worship to the Lord. Let's Hunger worship the King. Hunger for your righteousness, but it's only found in one place. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me to the holy of holies take the cold cleanse my lips here I am Lord oh, take me past the outer courts into the holy place past the brazen altar Lord 
I want to see your face Pass me by the crowds of people The priests who sing your praise I hunger and thirst for your righteousness But it's only found in one place Take me into the holy of holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me into the holy of holies Take the cold, cleanse my lips here I am. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. Let's give God praise. Amen. Amen. We serve a big, amazing God. You may be seated. That's how a sinful people can have a relationship with a holy God. 